Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Welcome to another special edition of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast. This is your host, Jake Stenziano, alongside my co-host, the coach, the mentor, the father of six, the multifamily land baron, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? J-Love, I am pumped to be here today. This is going to be a great call. We're going to bring the pain. Today, we're embarking on our fourth special edition podcast entitled The Gateway, into multifamily real estate investing. It's now time to focus our attention on building your team and what steps you need to take to surround yourself with the right people. On the first three Gateway podcasts, we cover goal setting and limiting beliefs, why multifamily real estate, how to pick your niche and market, where to find the money, and the value of a credibility book. So let's focus our attention today on building your team and the steps that it's going to take to surround yourself with the right people. Gino, how do we get started building a team? This is a vital component of any business and especially real estate because, you know, as you know, Jake, real estate is all about teams. It's all about having a network. Um, what we like to do here at Jake and Gino is we like to break down teams into what is called a primary team, a professional team, and a secondary team. Uh, we're going to go through every single team, tell you what guys are involved in what level, how you're going to solicit them, how you're going to build your team, and what they bring to the table for your um, business. Let's start out with the primary team members, which are, I think, the most important, the most vital. They're the guys that you talk to uh, weekly. And me and Jake, I wouldn't say weekly. I would say almost daily, probably hourly, Jake, right? I mean, it's At least uh, daily for sure. <laughs> and I'm sure that the wives don't, don't love that as much. But, I mean, we're talking all the time. And to have a vital and a, and a really growing partnership. Is it called a, a bromance? <laughs> yeah, well, we're, 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 getting, we're getting there. Really, but you need to speak, right? At least, I would speak to at least minimum once a day. You need to have that communication. He needs to tell me what's going on in the properties. I need to tell him what's going on with the social media. So you need to be able to be there for your partners. That's the first team member. I want to go through partners a little bit more, but let me m- mention the other two primary team members, which I think are just as vital. Um, the second one is family. Um, you need to have your family on board. For the most part, in the very beginning, they're probably going to have resistance. They're probably not going to want you to do this stuff. Like my mom said to me, what are you doing? You're going down to Tennessee, but you can't see the place, blah, blah, blah. She was giving me negative feedback because what I realized as a coach was she was trying to do that to protect me. She wasn't giving me negative feedback for me to fail. She was just protecting me, thinking that, you know what, let me protect him. Let me not let him go down there and fail. So she was sort of discouraging me to go down there. I mean, you're going to get a lot of pushback from family. they are going to come out of the woodwork and say, you know what, these tenants are crazy. It's, you know changing light bulbs and fixing toilets. And then you just say to them, have you ever done it? Well, no, I've heard. Well, if you've never done it, you've never experienced it, don't listen to that family member. You only want to listen to family members who are actually in the business or who are going to be positive because whatever you hear is what you act upon. So try to surround yourself with family members who are actually in the business or doing it. And also, you want to hear family members who are going to be positive to what you're doing. That's what you want. And if they're not, don't even talk about them with real estate. Don't even mention the word real estate to them because they're going to just bring you down. And they're not, they're not doing it to be negative. They're just worried about you. It, it's just a family member being protective. So don't, don't get upset with them. Just take it for what it is. They care about you, and, and that's that. And, Jake, I just, let me make this a little comparison. Would you go to a, a family member to go fix your car if your if your family member is a dentist, I mean, would you even ask you? You know, that's what I'm doing the comparison. They're giving you advice on something they've never ever done before. For the majority of of, of their family members, they've never done it. So why would they even give you any advice on real estate? Just because they've heard something from somebody. I mean, I've heard that my whole life. The last 15 years of doing this, people tell me, "What are you crazy? You're going down there. How do you do this?" And the, and the sad thing is, once you've had this massive success, all of a sudden. Everybody comes out of the woodwork that wants to give you money, which I thought was incredible. Hey, that first, sounds like a good idea now. Can I get in on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the craziest thing in the world. The first thing they're telling you, I don't know if I could do that. I don't think you should do that. It's not a good idea. Then all of a sudden they see some success and they all want to jump on the bandwagon, which is not a bad thing. But that's just how life is. Life is really hard to get that jet 
propulsion to get that you know get that rocket in the air it takes a lot to get it off the ground but once it's off the ground you're flying it's like jake likes to make that analogy with the snowball the snowball is really small and it's really hard to push and to get big but once it gets big then everyone jumps on the bandwagon but as you guys listening to this you have to start off with that snowball really small and you have to push it and that's where the hard work is once the snowball is growing and it's just building it's a lot easier it's just rolling down the hill it's just gonna you know pick up speed but for you guys you guys really have to start there and like i said you know family members if they're gonna give you problems just don't even bother you know mentioning to them uh the third one i think is probably one of the most important is uh you guys got to pick either a mentor or a coach now let me give you a couple of the distinctions between what a mentor and what a coach is to me and then i'll let jake rebut refute um you know give you his opinion to me i hear a lot of people saying i want to get a mentor a mentor is completely to me, is completely different than what a coach is. A coach is somebody you're going to pay for their knowledge, whether it's a business coach, a real estate coach. Um, you know, you look at these guys who are really super successful, guys like Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. They have multiple coaches. They have a financial coach. They have uh, sports coaches. I mean, they have a swing coach for Tiger Woods. Tons of coaches. These guys are all getting paid, coaches. They're all holding these guys accountable for what they do. A mentor is more like a teacher, somebody who's been there, done that, who wants to offer his time to you. And there's not much you can give back to a mentor other than you know him taking you under his wing and him teaching you. Mentors are great when you first start out. Try to get involved with as many people as you can. Bring them out to lunch. You know, pick their brain. But at the same time, it's not the same level as a coach. Coach, you're going to call up like I used when I first started out. I called the coach up. I set up a program with him. It wasn't cheap, but they had a structured program. They had a framework like Jake and I do where you follow it and you learn and you immerse yourself. And there's a lot of work involved. Coach is going to be detached. He's going to tell you what he thinks you should do. He's going to structure the program for you. You follow the program. You learn from the coach. I, I agree with what you're saying, and you can find mentors. It can be in a, in a value for value proposition. Uh, you know, for example, uh, in in the setup that Gino and I have, I was uh, on the ground uh, making it happen with the the property management stuff, and Gino was more of a uh, a mentor to me because he had the knowledge. So that was sort of what we each brought to the table, and you, you may be able to go out and find that in in your uh, market and, and and where you're currently investing. It just depends. But uh, sometimes mentors just come out of uh, relationships that you have, in, you know, in your professional experience and your personal lives. It just depends. But if you don't, if you don't have that, that's why coaches are there because there is a need. You need to get educated and you need that guidance. And Jake, this one other thing about mentors. I knew when I started mentoring you, quote unquote, mentoring you. I knew you were a guy who's going to make it happen. You're not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste your time. We started looking for properties, and I started teaching and mentoring you know, how to how to analyze these properties. And I knew that once we bought one, you're you aren't gonna you're gonna perform. You're there. You're gonna do the job. And, you know, if you're gonna go to a mentor, especially a mentor, and even a coach, just do what you say and say what you do. A mentor does not want to waste his time with you. He's a busy dude. He's probably been doing it for years, and he just doesn't want to sit there and waste his time. And I mean, obviously. If you can find a mentor you can partner with, that, that's, that's even more fantastic. So what Jake did is he partnered with me. Uh, I learned the business. you know, And on top of that, Jake got paid. He got paid a management fee. So I mean, mentorship can be really profitable for the guy who's being mentored also. And the mentor, mentor me, I, I profited also because we bought a great property and we started a business that way. So it can be a two-way street. But I don't think people should go to a mentor and constantly barrage him with questions if there's nothing. You know. It, it's okay for the first few times, but after two months of being a mentor, you have to bring something to the table. And if not, I think you got to start paying it. And I think that that relationship has to go into coach mode, where you say, "Listen, I need to pay you for these, you know, for these recommendations for what you're teaching me." I, I think that's where it becomes more of a burden to a mentor. You really want to, you really, you know, want to bring something to the table uh, in a mentor relationship. Yeah, it's a, it's like any business relationship. It's a value for value proposition. Without a doubt, and this this can kind of give us a minute to transition back into partners, because we kind of glossed over that. And I'm just going to pose this question to you, Gino. What do you look for in your partners? Because you have multiple partners, uh, probably ten businesses out there. What what are the highlights or key qualities that you look for in a good partner? Well, it's really weird, but I, I just like I want to like my partners. That's the first thing. If, if you know, you want to have to build rapport. That's the Barbara Corcoran thing. People do business with people they like. And, and, people, and even sales. People are going to buy stuff from you if they like you. Yep. And they would buy something inferior from you because they like you than somebody who's got a better product but is a jerk. So I think the first thing is you have to like the partner. I mean you're going to be speaking to him like we just referenced before a lot. You're going to have to basically build your business around your partner. You, you know, you have to understand that when you're in partnership, your partner's 
you know, going to work and he's providing for your family and you're providing for his family. So there's a huge burden in that. There's a big burden of responsibility there. I, I've been blessed because I've had a great partnership with my brother for 20 years. Um, we could trust him. Did I want to kill him? Yes. Did he want to kill me? Of course. That's just the way it is. Yeah, when but your brothers, though. So. Yeah, but I mean, he brought a lot of value to the table. He's a great course. <laughs> yeah, he's a hard worker. Yeah. But you know, we had the same similar, uh, you know, duties and responsibilities. Uh, you know, we could trust each other. I think trust is is, is vital. Uh, you but want. I think to- you guys have. It, it, well, you may not see. I think you have complementary skill sets though, because your brother is is very good uh, being in the front of the house with the sales, bringing in business. And and I think you were somewhat of a sounding board because you were you were saying, okay, I know what we need to do, I know what the things that need to get done to make the business function. And he was sort of the you know a little bit younger, high energy go getter. So I think there was those complementary skill sets working too with with the two of you. That's right. And the other thing with the partnership, Jake, you got to remember you, you you have to have similar goals like me and you in real estate. Well, let's bring it back to real estate. In real estate, uh, what attracted me and Jake together was we both wanted to create wealth. And generate passive income. Yep. Uh, if Jake said to me, "I want to fix and flip," I'd be like, "Jake, you can fix and flip. Do that yourself. Make a few bucks, save that money, then let's buy and hold." Uh, I w- couldn't be in a partnership with somebody who wanted to fix and flip because that would screw up my whole tax basis. I'd be paying income taxes on the property that he's flipping. For him, it's great because he's in a lower tax bracket than me when he first started out. He was a W two wage earner, so it was a completely different model for him. He needed. A- I wasn't there. I was already past that. I wanted to start building. And fortunately, I showed Jake that that's not the right model to do. It's a lot of competition, especially if you have some money to already start your you know, multifamily adventure. Let's start there. So I think you really need to be on the same page with a partner. I think what also needs to happen is those uncomfortable conversations, which Jake and I, you know, not often, but every now and again, we have to have them. Why did this property cash flow this month? Uh, what happened uh, on this property with the manager? Um, why did you do this to the employee? I think you have to be able to be uncomfortable with your partner because those situations are going to pop up all the time. And that's why you need an operating agreement. An operating agreement we have for every single LLC, but I think you need a, a Something that incorporates the whole business, whether it's a mission statement. You know, Jake likes to you know set up systems in his business, and that's one of the things he did. He he, he set up a mission statement for our partnership and for the businesses, and you, that's like your core beliefs. What what your partnership is is guiding towards. Um, you need to have all the partners on the same page, and that operating agreement needs to stipulate exactly what goes on. So we know that Jake is getting paid to manage these properties. You just can't go on a whim and a handshake because it's not fair to Jake and it's not fair to us because we, we're continuing to buy. And the more you buy, the more responsibility he has. So he has to know his duties and his responsibilities, and it holds him accountable and it holds us accountable uh, when you have everything written down. Um, what what about trust? I think I think that it can only go so far, and I think the point that you made with the operating agreement is huge. But try to, you know, I would say vet the person as best you can before you get into business with them because it's it's a long-term relationship, especially if you're going to be buying hold. So you need to be able to, to the best of your ability, trust that person and, and to Gino's point, have the similar goals uh, and also know that that person is going to bring the work ethic that you're going to bring to the table or things are going to, you know, things could get tough. Things could get rocky because if you're working, you know, really hard and then your, your partner is not putting in the same amount or, or not living up to the expectations that can get frustrating at times. And that'll kill any partnership. That's why me and my brother last so long because we're both hard workers. Uh, you know, in the, in the, in the restaurant business, unfortunately, you've got to work during the holidays. You've got to work during times when people don't work. So I was conditioned my whole life to do that. So I had no, I have no problems working on Saturday, Sunday, whenever, you know, whenever it needs to happen. And if you don't have a partner who thinks like you do, who's like, you know what? I need my vacation time. I need this. When something needs to happen in your business, it doesn't matter if it's Sunday, eight o'clock. Yeah, it's not a W2 job, you know, (laughs) right? Yeah, it needs to happen. And you know what? Your partner can do it once, can do it twice. You can pick up the slack. But if you if you're slacking off, then you've got to go. I mean, and you know, it's okay for a partner to do certain things. Like I'm really good at writing blogs. I love to write. I'm awesome at that. Jake likes to do podcasts. So we both uh, do you know complementary. We both have complementary skills, but we have different you know skill sets. So it's okay if you delegate certain responsibilities. But as you know, as long as you guys know what each guy is responsible for, just go ahead and do it. So the two key takeaways here, if you're going to set up a partnership, would be, number one, you have to have similar goals. That's super important. And number two, similar work ethic, because you're going to want someone pushing as hard as you're pushing, and that's going to let the um, the business grow that much quicker, because you have two people working instead of one with really hardcore work ethics. So similar goals and similar work ethics, I think, are keys to a, a successful partnership. So Gino, the professional team, the accountants, 
we, we've been round and round about these. What uh, is important when selecting an accounting firm? Well, first thing, let's take a step back. When you first start out and you buy your first property, like Jake and I did, we bought a 26 unit property. Uh, what we wanted to do with that property was really learn the ins and outs of how to do your accounting, your profit and loss statements, your income statements, how to put in rent rolls. So when you start out small, I would recommend everyone to use software like QuickBooks. That's what we started out with. And it was funny because Jake was down in Tennessee and I'm up in New York and he'd send me the monthly rent rolls up and I had my bookkeeper up here doing it. Um, in the very beginning, it worked out great. But then after you start adding more properties and all of a sudden you have you know 100 units, it becomes cumbersome because he's got to input them down there. Then I got to do them up here. Now you have the cloud, obviously, which is great now because so QuickBooks can go on the cloud and you can do it, you know, remotely from anywhere. But when we were doing it a couple of years ago, it, it, we didn't have the cloud yet. So uh, I would definitely start out with a program like QuickBooks. Do it yourself for the first few months. Figure out, you know, how income expenses run, what a capital expenditure is. You know, be able to read that balance sheet, that income statement. It's really vital for your business. Once you start growing, hire a bookkeeper. Um, whether you can use her a few hours a week. Uh, a few hours a day, it's a really huge burden to take off your plate because you you want your reports done at the end of the month. You want to be able to generate reports, especially for the partners, you know, weekly. Uh, we want to know uh, April 15th, why they're 7, 10 and still not paid. Why are we not charging late fees? Uh, what's going on with these expenses? These expenses are high this month. So you really need to have an accounting for every single property. And we put every property into a separate LLC because – We'll be able to account for each property, what's going on with them. We'll see the performance of every property. That's important. Is it cumbersome? It is. Is it costly? Yes. But we do that for a couple of reasons. We do it because we want to segregate our responsibilities and our liabilities. So if something happens at property one, property two will be safe. Um, the con of that is, you know, each tax return might cost a thousand bucks to do. But when we want to go either sell a property or refinance the property, it's a piece of cake because it's all there. It's all broken down and the accounting is done well. Now, we're – at a crossroads in our business because we've grown to so quickly, so fast that we don't know what to do, whether we should hire a bookkeeper full time and just get an accountant to perform or should we just get an accounting firm? We're, we're hedging more towards an accounting firm. We're not there yet. Maybe when we hit a thousand units, we'll get a full time bookkeeper because when you get somebody full time, they become a wage earner. You have to start, you know, taxes, workman's comp, disability, all that. It becomes a, you know, a $50,000 employee can cost you 75 or 70, $75,000. So that's something to consider. Uh, you'll be controlling them. They'll be able to do more work for you. But at the same time, it does become costly. So uh, I think getting an accounting firm with a bookkeeper and staff, and you'll be able to you know, monitor their work all the time. You'll be able to have somebody who, who does work on the cloud. So you'll be able to see your reports you know, in real time. That's really important to be able to see on April 12th, wow, what happened with this plumbing expense? Why are we spending so much money on plumbing? Is there a water leak or something? That's really important. Um, as far as accountants, Jake, I, you, know, you can continue with that one. Well, I want to add some value to the listeners out there before we continue with accountants because we get a lot of questions uh, from people that have smaller portfolios who they should use for their property management software, and that ties right into accounting. Uh, there's these big uh, software companies out there that can be thousands of dollars per month, and people get freaked out, but they, they're saying, well, we need to use property management software. We want to track. We want to be looking extremely professional if we ever have to sell. So... If you guys want to check out a super affordable, uh, great beginner property management software, go to rentpost.com. It's R-E-N-T-P-O-S-T.com. It's extremely affordable. They have very clean rent rolls. And I think their mantra is something to the effect that property management software made easier or something to that. And it really is easy software. We've used it. I think for anyone starting out, that is a, a great uh, place to go look. And, uh, and and see if it's going to work for you. Because it, in the beginning, you don't want to spend a lot of money on property management software, uh, but you want to be uh, very professional and have very clean books. And I think that's a, a great place for people to start. But, Jake, at the same time, when we started out, I remember I had recommended that to you. And you're like, my, my leasing agent, my manager can't handle this stuff. It's just It was just too overwhelming for us in the beginning because we didn't have enough employees. And you were working at the time, so you couldn't delegate five or ten hours a week to learning the software. And then, you know, you have to turn over the employee. You got to train another employee. When you're smaller, it's a lot harder to do that in the very beginning. And that's, um, and that's the beauty of RentPost, though, because it's basically anyone can pick it up and really start using it from uh, day one. And there's not a huge learning curve. And that's I think that's the re- real value add there i wish we'd learned that from the very beginning right that would have been a huge oh it would have because we we tried the the more expensive stuff and uh we've we've mentioned this before we are not 
tech savvy. We are like the the two biggest tech idiots, and we're we're lucky to be on this podcast right now. So the fact that I can use it, anybody can use it. Um, so that's just a, a quick tip for folks out there. And let me segue right into the property manager. There's a website that you can go on to. Um, it's called irem, www.irem.org. They have a great list of uh, property managers. You go on your, you know, on your city, your state, and they'll list all the certified property managers on there. And you, you, if you're going to hire out, you need to vet them. You need to have a list of questions. Jake and I have a list of questions that we ask our you know, management companies. And we even look at them themselves and try to gauge on how we're building our management company. We're still self-managing right now. We're still in our market. We're growing the systems out. We're trying to make uh, a franchisable model where we can just pick it up and say, this is what we want our management company when we hire them to do. Um, it's property managers is if you're not doing it yourself, it's one of the most important team members. Make sure you know what they're charging and pay them because they're the ones who are going to you know maintain your asset. And it's a daily thing. Jake likes to say it's the wheel of the wheelbarrow. It's in constant motion, constantly going on. You're going to have you know I wouldn't say daily, but I would say at the very minimum weekly contact with the management companies. You want those you know we call them Monday morning reports. Every Monday morning, you want those reports on your computer to say, like I just referenced before, why do we have seven collections still left and it's April 12th? Those are the things that you need to do to, you know, to keep your property management company accountable. Uh, the next professional team member I'd like to touch on, uh, attorneys, lawyers, um, legal, this is, this is something that we try to get our costs fixed on when it comes to evictions. Uh, our evictions, I think, are fixed at 450 or $500 per eviction, including the detainer. And uh, we use one firm in town that's pretty much does a, a big bulk of the evictions. And they use uh, Nationwide Evict. I think it's uh, nationwideevict.com. Super easy. You go in, you put the unit, put the person's uh, information in there, what's owed. It's, it sends it directly to the, um, the law firm. They go out to get the detainer. 14 days later, you're in court and, and you wrap it up. So I would try to find a, some fixed cost um, services out there and they do exist and you shouldn't I don't think you should be really paying over $500 per eviction and if you can get that that's great and that's going to streamline it's going to be a system it's going to make things a lot easier uh, but you will need attorneys for things like acquisitions um, it's going to really help you want to go over your contracts um, and also your your operating agreements these these things are all things that you're going to need um, you know real estate uh, lawyers for Gina what else do you want to say about that well, as far as lawyers, you want a, you want an attorney who does real estate, and you want an attorney who has clients who are in real estate, and maybe the attorney even owns real estate, so he understands the whole model. He understands what you're trying to do. Jake talked about the, the the eviction. I think it's really an awesome model to have that, only because when you do evictions and you've got small properties, you might become friends with your tenants, and it might be a really difficult thing to do um, to take that personal out of it because it is a business and if they can't pay you they've got to get out because you've got bills to pay it's a great way to go I mean because you're using the attorney and that fee is really really very reasonable and you you just go through that whole step and um, it makes you do it because if you're a friend you're like oh you know what another, another five days I'll pay I'll pay you just set up that system where you call that service and it gets done I think that's an awesome idea um, Jake and I are going to touch on a little bit later when you start syndicating, you know, an SEC attorney, which is different than a real estate attorney. But I think if you're going to start raising money, I think you need to have an SEC, SEC attorney, securities and exchange attorney on your team. That's yeah, that that's for sure. That's going to be when you start to scale your business, when you get bigger. Um, Gina, what qualities do you look for in a mortgage broker? You know, uh, we've gone back and forth on this. We used the mortgage broker in the beginning. I mean, if you, if you can get a bank and you can start doing a bank directly like we do, we have a great relationship with a bank, you might, have, you might be able to circumvent the mortgage broker. You know, the pros of a mortgage broker is they don't get paid until they do the closing. And Jake and I found that out the hard way, right, Jake? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we ended up paying some guy, gave him a down payment. That was our second deal we were thrilled we were gonna get an sba loan and the whole nine yards and you know when we're ready to close we call up whatever his name was i'll call him freddie freddie disappeared and uh it was a struggle to get our money back um that's one thing with the mortgage broker if they're asking you for money up front you tell them to run you just run and look the other way right 
Right, Jake? No, I thought I thought I was. You know, it was when we first started investing. This guy's saying, "Oh, we can get this done, and you got to you know pay a couple bucks up front." And I'm thinking, "Oh, maybe this is just the way things are." I'm like, "Okay, uh, you know, if we can get a great loan out of it, we'll, we'll, we'll pay a few bucks." And uh, Freddie and Five Fingers ran. Freddie Five yeah, Fingers took the money and ran. <laughs> yeah, I should have stepped in. I should have said, "You know, I know this isn't right." I had that gut feeling, and that's where I think I let us down a little bit because I didn't have that uncomfortable conversation with him in the beginning and said, "Listen, this doesn't look. This doesn't sound kosher." Um, you know, so guys, mortgage brokers do not take a nickel until the deal is done. The other thing with the mortgage brokers, they can farm out your job. Uh, I'm sorry, they can farm out your your loan to a lot of different banks. They have a lot of different options. If you're going to Bank ABC, Bank ABC has one product. Mortgage broker can go to Bank A, Bank B, Bank F. They can go to any bank and they can actually try to fit your deal within the parameters of the bank. So they have a lot of different options. Mortgage brokers do. Um, the the next up is insurance, and we should have tied this in with the attorneys a little bit because people realistically look at uh, some of these insurance documents and probably just scratch their head and say, what the hell is this saying? You can utilize your legal team to actually review your insurance documents to make sure that there are not any loopholes or there are not any you know major gaps. And I think that's another thing you want to consider using um, your attorneys for to review those insurance documents. Um, there's going to be a million uh, insurance guys out there beating down your door for your business, um, but at the end of the day, it's you just have to you have to evaluate these. You have to look for the best price, but you also have to look for the gaps. And I think that's why it's so important to bring in the attorney because they may, if you get an attorney that's an expert here, they will be able to evaluate these uh, insurance documents to identify those gaps so you can compare you know apples to apples. And I was just about to say that if you're going to look at an insurance policy and one guy's cheaper than the other, you got to ask yourself why. You know, we want business interruption insurance on our policies. If something happens to one of the buildings and burns down, we want to continue to pay, get paid for the rents. Um, you got to make sure that's in there. Uh, you got to make sure the deductibles are the same. You got to make sure the replacement cost is the same. There's a lot of different variables when you go to buy property and they have insurance in place. The best thing to do is to get their policy, see what they're paying, and go farm it out. And the great thing about when you get bigger, the economies of scale start kicking in. You have two and three and four properties, and bam, all of a sudden you're getting better rates because you're getting, you know, you're getting um, that economies of scale. You want to be able to get umbrella liability insurance to be able to cover all the properties. That comes down, that gets a little bit cheaper. And one other thing with insurance companies, just like everybody else, you have to keep them honest. So you have to farm that that product out. You're pricing out every year. When it comes up for renewal, make sure you get get a quote from him and shop that price around. I mean, if you want to keep the relationship and somebody comes in a thousand dollars cheaper, and you like your insurance broker, keep it because what they're doing is they're probably they're doing a bait and switch to new guys. They want to lower the price to get you in. Then the next year they're going to raise you. So just farm that product price out every year. See where they are and make adjustments to your policies. Agree, hundred um, percent. It, it's just one of those things you're going to have to get multiple quotes. It, it's going to be work. But it's going to be worth it in the long run because it's it's one of your uh, highest costs. So you really got to look at that closely. And Jake, this is another thing that I just forgot to mention, but it should be obvious. But to a lot of people, it might not be. Get an insurance broker who does your business. If you if you're fixing and flipping, yes, yes. get that type of insurance broker. We do multifamilies. That's what we want. We want guys who insure apartment buildings. So. And you can you can potentially look at one umbrella policy for all your properties. So you don't need necessarily an umbrella po- uh, policy on each property. You may be able to get one that covers all of them. That's another thing to look out for. Um, next up, real estate brokers. Uh, different from mortgage brokers, these are going to be, um, if you're just starting out, some people may call them agents, real estate agents. Um, but the, the broker's going to, we, we like to have a, a, a different strategy, maybe not than, than all people, but we don't typically bring in our own real estate agent broker on any of these deals. We want to deal with one person that can really get our message across to the seller without uh, messing it up too badly because the minute you tell you bring in a real estate agent a real estate broker and then they tell the broker um, your message and then the broker tells the owner by that point what you wanted to convey uh, is lost so the less people the better and the broker if you're working with one broker they're gonna work harder to get that deal done if they're the only one involved because they're not splitting commission with anyone so it is really in in all of our situations we only want to deal with one broker. We don't want to bring in a bunch of people to muddy the waters. I could do a whole podcast on brokers. So <laughs> you know you love brokers. Show. Come on. Um, I love brokers who love to work. I always say to Jake, and I'd like to mention a lot, It's it, this is the classic 80-20 rule where 20% of the brokers have 80% 90, of the business. <laughs> I, probably closer, but I like my I like my Paisan Pareto. Gotcha. So I'll give him the credit, the 80-20. 
you have to find the ones who are doing 80% of the business because they're the ones who are going to have the quote unquote pocket listings, the stuff that doesn't hit the market. And there's a few, <clears throat> there's a few ways you can figure out how to do that. First thing is go on LoopNet. Look at who is listing the majority of the properties. In Knoxville, Jay can tell you there's four or five really big players down there. Um, we were fortunate that we stumbled on a, a really great broker on our first deal, and we've had that relationship. You guys need to take these brokers out to lunch. You guys need to show them your credibility book. You need to show them what you're looking for. Um, our broker's not going to bring us a duplex because that's not what we're looking for. We don't want to waste his time, and he doesn't want to waste our time. Let them know exactly what you're looking for. Go to the MLS. Um, go to the Chamber of Commerce. Start reading real estate publications in your area. Start reading the news. See what brokers are doing what you're in your business, in your, in your area. Start networking with them. Um, start asking them to send you deals. At first, they're going to send you crappy deals just to test you. You tell them exactly. Like I always tell Jake, we want a 10% cash on cash, a cap, and one three debt service coverage ratio. They know that. They know you're a serious player. They're not going to bring you crappy deals anymore. They're not going to waste your time. The other thing is... Do what you're saying. Say what you do. If you're going to close in a deal and you sign a contract, that broker is – once that deal is signed, he's expecting that money. That money's already spent. You do not want to start breaking contracts, start retrading for silly things. If you're going to close in a deal with the broker, you close in the deal and you do what you say. You create that relationship because the next deal coming down the pike, who is he calling? He's calling you because you, you performed on the first one. And I'll let Jake speak to that because that really helped launch our career. Well, it's important because we are able to get two to three uh, decent-sized deals done per year. And the reason for that is the brokers know we're closers. They know that when we get into it, they're going to push for our offers because they know we get the deal done, and we get it done every time, and we get it done quick. You need to be able to perform. You need to be able to show that you can do that. So when a broker is, you know, you may be uh, going against a, another buyer, and the broker is going to say, no, I've worked with these guys before. They get the job done. They do what they say they're going to do. Therefore, the broker is going to promote you to the seller, even if your price is a little less, because they want to get it done and they want to move on, uh, especially if they're motivated. So that's going to really catapult you to the top of the list and help you close more deals. And Jake is 100% correct with that. Let me give you the, the transition that we had. When we bought our 25-unit property, it was with the broker. We bought the 36-unit property, it was the same broker. Then we saw a property on LoopNet, which was 136 units. It's sitting out there for years and years and years. And lo and behold, our broker's got a good relationship with this seller. Um, I think that relationship, along with our tenacity, really helped us seal the deal because I think the, the seller was a little wary of us. Can they close? Can they not close? We had already done two deals with the broker in this, within six months. And the broker's like... These guys are going to close. So it really gave us a lot of credibility and it gave us an ability to um, really you know, talk, to the, talk to the seller. And we had got the relationship through the broker. The broker knew us and from us knowing us, it was so much easier for them to talk to the seller. It was. And, uh, and then from there, I think we did two, two other deals, two or three other deals within the next year with the same guy. Yep. So you know he's he's got a track record with us that he can show to, uh, to these sellers and say, look, these guys get it done. And and that's that's so powerful. And one cool thing about brokers is you're not paying them, right, Jake? I mean, the seller's paying them. So, you know, I mean, he's getting paid. Our broker was great because he was he was a guy who thinks outside the box. We did seller financing with this broker. He knew all about that strategy. Choose a broker who's in your niche. I just said that about the insurance broker. You know, you want a broker who's doing multifamilies if you're going to get into the multifamily space. That's really important because if he's out selling single family homes to moms. It's, he, they're of no value to you. They really aren't because they're not in the, they're not in the market. They don't know what a cap rate is. They don't know how to, you know, analyze a 36 unit deal. They don't know what per door costs are. You want to talk to somebody who's in it, who's been listing these properties, who's been selling these properties, and then he'll have that, you know, team around him. And it, we have, we got a lot of great value and a lot of team members from our, broker because we were looking at our second property we needed quotes from contractors we were relatively new we didn't have a team really established right jake so we asked our broker and he got out contractors out for us so before we closed on the property we already had you know estimates about tree work about brick work and we didn't have these team members our broker had those contacts yeah great resource uh the next one that we're going to talk about is the inspector and this is somebody that, like again, we're doing a couple deals, two, three deals a year. We're going to be in close contact with this guy quite often because every time we're doing a deal, he's going to be going in to inspect. And you're going to really have to shop this because we saw 
the price spectrum go from twenty dollars per unit all the way up to two hundred dollars per unit uh, for inspections. So you're going to see a, a wide range of prices. So you may have to shop this with you know five to ten different uh, inspectors in your area and really find out what you're looking for. We're looking for rent-ready units. So we want the, the, the flooring to be in, in good condition, working appliances, and uh, some of these sellers may try to um, sell you something where there's 200 units and there may be four down units. So you have to get in every single one of those units to make sure they are rent-ready prior to closing. And a good inspector is not only going to be able to do that, but also find structural and other issues with the property there if, that if need to be fixed prior to closing, you can have a good inspection to present to the sellers and say, hey, look, this is what's going on with it. What can we do about it? And as far as pricing goes, I, I think on the smaller houses, duplexes, tries, quads, uh, depending on your market, they'll give you a flat fee, whether it's 500 bucks or 700 bucks, And that's just worth its weight in gold because you find one little thing wrong where you can retrade, boiler's bad, uh, the floors are bad. I mean, it's it's you're, you're protecting yourself. I would never, ever not buy a property without an inspection. Um, I think it's crazy. I think if people are trying to save money, that's not the place you save money because you want to know going in what needs to get done. And these guys are professionals. They're going to properties every day. Um, our guy is pretty, he's pretty thorough. I mean, takes a lot of pictures. So he knows, exa- lets exactly know, um, you know, what's going on. A picture's worth a thousand words because when you tell, show to the seller, hey, listen, you know, this roof's got holes in it. We have to do it. The picture's there. Seller can't say no. I mean, it's, it's, it's written down. It's got a picture right there. Um, you want, the inspector definitely needs to go into every single unit. I don't care whether you have 300 units or 30 units. You need to know that all the appliances are there. You need to know everything is working inside the unit. You need to know the hot water heaters. And it's also for you too because when you're buying a property and you have 30 units, you want to know how old those water heaters are because you need to start to set up the CapEx account to figure out how much money you need to put aside to start replacing a lot of these assets. So how old are the air conditioning units? Uh, how old are the hot water heaters? Uh, that's stuff that's really important. Um, don't cheap out on this guy, make sure you pay him and make sure you give him a little bit of lead time. So once you put the property in the contract and you have all your financial due diligence, it's, it's, you know, it's ready to go. Give him a call as soon as possible. Try to get him on the docket because you do not want to waste time. Sometimes these guys are busy. They're a couple weeks out, but like, you know, Jake and I, we're lucky. We've got a great relationship with ours. If we needed to get done, he'll, he'll break everything and he'll come on our property within three days. But when you're first starting out, guys, get him on the docket as soon as possible. Uh, next up is the title company. We are so fortunate uh, to have the title company that we use. They have been such a tremendous help uh, when we've been growing our business. Uh, they've uh, they've been there for us, sending out the documents on time, doing all the little things to make your experience easier. I don't have any really great advice as to how to shop a title company other than to ask your broker, who are you using, what's the experience been like, and um, and the like. So, Gina, what do you, what do you get to say about title companies? Um, they're really important for us. They, they, they draft through our operating agreements. Um, I'm up here in New York, so stuff comes up next day. Uh, I've got to get stuff down. Uh, it's always in the mail. They're really reliable. They know what they're doing. And what's weird about it is they should be good because it's a process. Like Jake and I really realize it's like a recipe. They're doing the same thing all the time. So they should have the steps in order. It really shouldn't be that difficult, but I've seen a lot of them just fail and not do what they're supposed to do. Um, Ours is great. We have the same process every time. Get the contracts up. Get the operating agreement up. Get everything signed. Right, Jake? No, it, but it's it just, sounds it, so it, simple. It is, but, but we're just fortunate because I, we got lucky on the first one um, with the first title company that we used. And it was just I think it was just dumb luck. <laughs> no, really. We, we got lucky, but they just knock it out every time. Documents are on time. Um, all, the, all the closing statements look good. And um, we've been very fortunate with, with, with our title uh, folks. Now the next one, I wish we were just as fortunate with uh, with this next one as uh, as a title company. Oh, the appraiser. Yes, the appraiser. The the roll of the dice, the roulette table. <laughs> I'll let Jake. I'll let Jake describe the pain, and then I'll show you one of my painful stories. So, well, the, the one of the hardest things uh, or the toughest things dealing with appraisers are when you're going to refinance uh, a property. You really, uh, they're going to look at the income approach. They're going to look at comps, and they're going to look at replacement costs. Well. One of the things we've struggled with is we've taken properties from fifty three thousand a month to ninety three thousand a month, and we've done it in a short period of time. And then, okay, at that point, we're looking to refinance and pull some money out and roll that money into our next property. Well, we had one appraisal group that, that just said, you know, uh, we got to really look at the comps 
on this one and, and, and really value that into the income approach as well. And we just were not getting a fair uh, appraisal based on the income of the property. They were, I think they were really lowballing us. So we had this whole refi going on. We had mortgage brokers in place, and they gave us a really bad lowball appraisal. So then we had to stop the process, start up with another mortgage broker, get the property reappraised at a fair price before we could refinance. And it, and it slowed it would take us another 90 days to yep. get, accomplish what we needed to get done. And there was nothing, we were doing everything correct. We just, I don't know what this guy's problem was, but he didn't give us a fair appraisal and it, it really, it slowed our uh, progression down. And the thing with appraisals, Jake, they're not cheap, right? I mean, well, and, much- and the, it's going to be the bank's going to select the appraiser. So it's not – the challenge there is you can't have somebody that you know is a good appraiser and, and really push that guy into the role. The bank – it's kind of a, a bank selection process. Um, so, I mean our, a commercial appraisal for a small building for my mom is 2000 bucks, and literally I, – I mean I don't want to – and, and they're going there, taking a few pictures, and pulling everything off CoStar, right? Yeah, I don't want. <laughs> like, I don't know what the word is. I don't want to denigrate her, but I mean, there's really was not a lot of work involved in that one. Yeah. In, in our bigger deals, there is more work involved. But hey, when you're paying ten grand for an appraisal, I mean, they better put a couple of days work in it, uh, at least, at the very least. But I, I've got a property right now that I'm trying to refinance, and um, the property right now they came back. It's it's unfortunate because in my market, <clears throat> there's not many comps for four for four families. So there's a couple things going on in, in this situation. The income on the property is great because I've got a garage there and I've got a storage thing. So I'm, the income is, is really fantastic and has been that way for the last five or six years. My problem is he pulls up these comps. He pulls up one comp that's a four-family, Jake. And I'm like, dude, the thing sold for three ninety five, dollars But it looked like he got hit by a, by a missile. You know what I'm saying? It looked like he was in Baghdad basically. <laughs> they had to put another, zone, yeah. yeah. They had to put another $100,000 into the property. So it wasn't a $400,000 sale price. It was minimum five hundred. dollars But you know, the guy's only looking at what it sold for. And obviously the, when your house is like that, his income is nowhere near mine. His expenses are nowhere near mine or I'm running my property more efficiently. Yeah, awesome. So it was so frustrating for me. I'm going through it right now. So I mean people might think, oh, the little properties are easier to appraise and uh, not in my case because I'm getting the short end of the stick because there's nothing in my market that's selling for that. So for me – But he should just be looking at the income at this point. Take the comps in consideration but look at the income and, and But that's the, the problem with first. Fannie. The problem with Fannie is they don't only – when you're a four family, they don't look at any ulterior or any exterior income on the property. They're only looking at the four units. And still, he still undervalued me. But um, that, that's the problem with, with the four families, with the, with the residential because they look at comps a lot. When you get into the bigger properties, it's not about that. You know what it's about? It's about NOI, net operating income. That's what it's about. That's how you value. So there's less less a person being subjective about it. It's more objectivity with the larger properties. With the smaller properties, you know, it's, it's a roll of dice with the appraiser. And he came in at 400. My mortgage broker got him. My mortgage broker says it's not going to appraise. I thought maybe 500. When he came in at 400, I was like, oh, man, I'm not even close here. So I wasted my 500 bucks and I took my lumps. And that was my story. I bought this property years and years ago. That's why I'm just not going to dabble with the little properties anymore because it's more, you know, the whim of the market. And I thought, listen, if there's no four families in the area, there should be more competition for that. There should be more of a demand for for family, but I guess he didn't see my uh, my point of view. I'm I'm smelling an owner financing deal. Time Dude, to sell that baby. And and that you know what this brings me to another thing. It's not really a team member, but I think Jake. What we ended up doing is we ended up getting a modification on it. Um, it was part of an Aquin deal. Um, you know, Aquin they got sued by the federal government. They made they went up and they um they made a settlement. So my rate is really high because I had this property years ago. So Jake, if I tell you I'm paying six and three quarters in this property, Jake. Oh. I mean that hammered. So, I mean, it's not owner-occupied. So if it was owner-occupied, it'd be a lot easier. But we're still, you know, we're not underwater, but we're, we're pretty close. So it's difficult. So we're just going to go and get a modification, get the rate knocked down to 3%. Um, and I mean, that's just the way it has to happen. I mean, there's no other way. I've tried every other way to do it, but sometimes it just doesn't work and i um, going to do a modification on it. So this has been uh, basically our list of our professional team members. It's not all encompassing. There's other folks out there such as architects and whatnot that we, we could touch on another call. But we wanted to give a broad perspective of the folks that we're using on a, uh, on a regular basis. Jake, let me just jump into the secondary team members. Um, I want to start off just by listing the contractors, and then we'll, we'll go into a few of them that we think are really vital for your team. Let's start out with the general contractors, the landscapers. Um, you know, the guys who are your maintenance team, the plumbers, the carpenters, those are all guys that you just have to start developing relationships with. At the very beginning, 
and even during you know your whole tenure as an owner, you really want to get three prices per job. Um, yeah, three prices per job. And keep in mind, you're not going to know these folks most likely when you're getting into it. Uh, great resources. <clears throat> use your bankers. Use your brokers. They're probably going to have folks out there in the community that they know are reputable that they can refer you to. Uh, we actually just got a new painting crew, and we got it from our banker. Uh, he, he said these guys have been doing a lot of jobs similar to you, um, similar to what you guys own, and we just got a, a great new painting crew. We couldn't uh, be happier with them. So the, it's really uh, we really like to work on the referral basis. Um, one tip uh, actually, I'll give me give you two tips. The first thing is you do not pay them all at once. If you want to pay them a portion to start with, then a portion while they're going through the job, then the rest of it at the end of the job. If you don't do that, they're not coming back to your property. They've got other jobs going on. You want to keep them on the hook. But at the same time, the second tip is once they're done, you make sure you cut that check right away because you want these guys to be responsive and want them to come back to Jake's job. Because if Jake is a slow payer or a no payer, and Jake has a big water leak, and all of a sudden, if the plumber doesn't come by within two hours, we're going to have a big problem. You want to be able to say, John, I need you here. Can you get here within two hours? John's going to drop what he's doing. He's going to come to you because he knows that Jake pays when the job's done, and Jake is a responsible guy. We we actually, this is a quick tip for you guys out there to get your uh, make sure your contractors are working hard for you. We pay our contractors on a weekly basis. Um, the bookkeeper gets mad at me sometimes, and it's it's a lot of work, but we make sure that we pay our uh, contractors on a weekly basis, and it's been it's worked really well for us. Uh, these next two or three team members, secondary, I just want to highlight them real quick. First one is laundry. Uh, we go into properties. We buy mom and pops. A lot of the laundry rooms aren't working. People are like, yeah, I don't want to split the revenue with any company. I'm going to do it myself. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. So what happens is you have, <laughs> right? you have one maintenance guy doing 100 units plus the laundry. And he's got to be a, a technician on laundry machines. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got you to get the quarters. And you know what? If you're living on the property and you want to go collect quarters every week, be my guest. Is it worth an extra 20 bucks? Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Your focus shouldn't be there. Your focus should be to be able to provide the service. We bought the property. Half the machines weren't working. The other half were crappy and old. And tenant goes into a laundry room. The machine doesn't work. How would you feel? I'd be really pissed if I, the machine wasn't working and, and, I, and I had to do laundry. So first thing we did is we pulled them all out. Jake was actually you know, entrepreneurial enough to say, listen, I'm going to sell these machines. Put them on Craigslist. He bling, sold them. Bling. Yeah, and you know what? We got a good number for them too. Yep. Um, we called up a company called CoinMac. They came in. They'll tell you how many machines you need. Uh, they, they supplied all the machines for us. And fortunately, we had a lot of plumbing already in, so that was great for us. And we, did a, we, we started out with a 60-40 split then. And then you know, after we started growing, we got 60% of the revenue. They got 40% of the revenue. It takes a big burden off. The machines, I wouldn't say they're brand new. They're reconditioned, but they're in good shape. Something happens no, to sometimes them. Sometimes you can't get brand new ones too. That's great. Yeah. If, you can get brand, if you can get brand new ones, it's all about negotiation, right, Jake? It's yep. what you ask for. Yep. You know, they come out monthly to collect the coins. Make sure you're there with them to count it because, you know, sometimes money gets disappeared. Make sure your manager goes out and meets with them. Um, so there's something wrong with the machine. They'll come out. They'll service it, which is huge because I don't want a tech fixing a machine, wasting two hours on a laundry machine when he could be doing something to a tenant's uh, apartment, which is more important. That's right. That's right. And they'll pay you uh, an advance up front uh, for future uh, commissions, which is great. You want to discuss the, uh, the you know the amount of years and, and the contract that they? Uh, it's all negotiable. I, I think typically it's between five and seven years, and and they'll give you. Um, I think it's correct me if I'm wrong. Six months up front of, of projected commissions, and then you just kind of you just work off of that, uh, and uh, and you definitely can get a sixty forty split with these guys. So and Jake, another tip is when we buy the properties, uh, any any owner is going to assume that that um, contract. So make sure part of your due diligence is to see what kind of company they have, what kind of contract they have. Cause that can, that can definitely, if you if you just locked in, if the seller just locked into a contract for six years at a crappy rate, that's going to affect you. So that there's some negotiation involved in there. So make sure you review the contracts that are in place. Cause you're going to assume those contracts. That's right. <clears throat> Next one is rubs. Uh, I'm going to let Jake run with this one because he loves rubs. Rubs, ratio utility billing systems. This has been a huge revenue uh, generator for us. Uh, we actually do our rubs in-house. Uh, essentially, there's there's a bunch of companies out there that do uh, ratio utility uh, billing systems. It's a bill back of the water and sewer. <laughs> Some people bill back for, for garbage and, and other things. But when when we get by these mom-and-pop properties, they're paying a lot of the utilities. Most of the time, they're paying water. They're paying trash. Essentially, what we do is we come up with a flat fee 
fixed rate cost that we bill back to the tenants every month that's less than what we're actually paying for those services. But it's close. Uh, you just don't want to exceed what your actual costs are. And then that way it's, it helps share some of the burden of the expenses on the property. Tenants are paying for what they're using, and it helps to um, alleviate some of that stress uh, from the expenses that are put on uh, to the ownership. I think you guys should all go to a website. It's NWP, NWP, and at least research it. If your market is, uh, if you're fortunate like us, our market doesn't. Everyone, every landlord does it, so it allows us to be able to do it. And what we like to do is we like to look at companies and target properties that don't have rubs because right away, once you once you install that, you're making an extra 30, 40 bucks per unit per year, you know, per month. Per, per month. Year. It's, it's yeah. yeah, per month. It's it's a really big gener- revenue generator. So um, go to NWP, you know, read about it because you don't have to put any submeters in, which is great. I mean, it saves you a ton of money and it's a common practice. And the other thing that we found is all of a sudden tenants are starting – they get billed back for their water. What happens? Usage drops. I mean, they've shown that usage, water usage drops by 60% when tenants start paying part of the bill. There's no reason on a 100-unit complex that this can't be um, forty to $50,000 per year uh, that you can collect just on uh, Rub's bill back. So That's something huge. to think about. It's huge. Um, next one uh, is the resident manager. Um, you know, we can speak about it. Jay can talk about it. But you know, the resident manager, guy who's there in the office, is the face of the company. You need to train this guy. You need to tell him exactly what to do. You need to have systems put in place. He's the face of the company. He's the he's the first touch of anybody calling in the company, calling in, renting out. Uh, he's got their their vital team member. A lot a lot of times, the resident manager is going to be responsible for leasing units getting units ready, taking maintenance calls, and maybe light maintenance. On a smaller property, say 25 units, resident managers are great. They may live in a unit, and uh, then, but they're, they're the ones that are going to be really handling that property. They're going to be managing that little property for you, and they're going to be your contact as to how things are going. So you really got to um, you know, take care of these folks, make sure you're paying them well, and, uh, and make sure you get the right person in there because they can make or break uh, your business. And finally, let's talk about web guys. Um, web guys are a dime a dozen. Um, you really want to research a guy and pay him a little bit more. The most important thing about web design is you you want somebody who's got SEO. You want somebody to be able to see your website when they Google it. You want to be able to come up on the search engines. I mean, and also that's really important, but also you want something that's visually appealing. I mean, we're, we're constantly growing our website, unfortunately, because it's costing us more and more money, but we're adding new features on there. You, you, we have a resident portal, but now we're gonna, residents can start paying on our site. We have maintenance calls. You know, you want to do updates on the website. You want to have attractive pictures. This is like your business card. I mean, everyone should have a website if they're going to have a property. It's just common. Yeah, you can't. You can't. There's people, and that's one of the things we look for when we're buying these apartments. Is that some of these larger apartment complexes that we're buying from don't have a website? You, seriously, I, I almost can't believe it. But it's multiple of these uh, properties we bought have not had websites. And let me let me give you a tip on a website. Even if you've got a four unit property, you might think I'm crazy. What do I need a website for? It's not going to cost you a lot of money to set it up. You can do videos of your property. Stick up the videos on YouTube. Stick them up on your website before a tenant even comes out. They can click on the video, see exactly what the apartment looks like. It'll save you a ton of time. Guy goes, I want to come out and look at it. Well, before you come out and look at it, go to my website. Take a look at the video. See if you like the property. It's 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 you're going to turn a suspect into a prospect. That prospect's going to go, well, I like it on the video. Let me come out and see it. Then you, you know, then you've saved a ton of time. You go out the, you go out there. It's already sold before he goes out there. So I mean, that's why I, I love uh, websites. Yeah, it's it's not even an option you have to have in these days. So. Jake, let's segue really quick into uh, raising money on Touchbot Syndication. Sure. Now, <clears throat> neither one of us is a lawyer, so right now you know we're both idiots when it comes to tech. <laughs> we have no idea about <laughs> lawyers, right? But, the, the 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 whole gist of the story is you want to hire somebody who does know that and when you talk about lawyers you know hire somebody who's in the business and pay them when you start raising money and doing syndication you need to get in touch with a securities lawyer um you need to know all the rules i can go over a couple of, of definitions and stuff that you need to look for but once you start raising private money whether it's from your uncle or from your family members or from uh a business professional you really want to know the laws because you might be creating a security that's why it's important to get in touch with a security lawyer. A couple of definitions you need to know, an accredited investor, that's somebody who you really want to target, somebody who's making, I think, what over $200,000 a year or and or you know a million dollars of net worth liquid. It's really important to target these guys because they're more savvy. Um, security lawyer is going to be able to draw up documents for you. 
private placement memorandum, subscription agreement, operating agreement. These are things that you have to discuss with him. Um, really vital. They're not cheap, but if you go get sued, something happens with the investors, investors are going to know exactly what they're getting into. It's really important that you guys get in touch with them and create all these documents. Yeah, and, and one of the folks we forgot to touch on when we were talking about our professional team members, uh, cost segregation consultants, get good people on your team because – you don't want to be messing around with these documents that you really don't know about or trying to do a cost segregation study yourself. Pay the little extra, get the professional in there that knows what they're doing and do the right thing. Be on the right side of right. It's not worth messing around with this stuff. Now, Jake, I'm going to pull a little life coaching on you, okay? Oh, wrap- watch out now. We're going to wrap this whole thing up because uh, I'm sure people's level of energy has been raised by, by listening to the two of us banter back and forth. But this is what I want people to think about when they go through their day. Um, and when they start planning stuff out, when you start talking to a coach, coach should actually start asking you questions, what I like to call empowering questions, thought provoking, you know, energy raising questions. Once you go, go through your day, plan your day out Sunday night and think about these four questions because these are really important questions to think about. Number one, what frustrates you about your life or your business? Now let me ask that to Jake real quick. Jake, what frustrates you about your life or your business? Well, We've gone from zero units to nearly 700 units in about a three-year span, and it maybe just sound a little crazy, but sometimes I get frustrated that we're not growing quick enough, and we're not expanding our team quick enough. And so sometimes I get a little crazy about that because I want things done yesterday. But uh, So I get a little frustrated because I want everything done yesterday. I want to move quicker, um, but that's one thing that frustrates me. So that's cool. Jake identifies that he can write that down and he can work on it. So every time he gets frustrated, he can pick up the phone and say, Gino, we're not growing quick enough. And I'm saying, listen, this is what you need to work on. You, you shouldn't get frustrated about it because that's something that's great. It's a, that's a good problem to have. So he's looking at that as a problem. I'm looking at, at that as an opportunity because, I mean, I never would have thought we'd have grown this quickly. And maybe two years ago, Jake never would have thought about it either. But now that he's doing it, he can actually plan about that frustration. Um, what frustrates me? Uh, right now, I'm transitioning into doing this full time. So what's frustrating to me is I'm, I'm really learning the model on how to manage these properties and how to really try to take over property. It's frustrating to me because I haven't really done a big one by myself. I'm trying to learn another market right now. I'm trying to make contact. So that's what's frustrating to me. So I have to step back and say, listen, it'll be okay. It's a learning process. Rome wasn't built in a day. You're going to have to learn. So I can actually you know, take it easy, calm down, and I can actually work on my frustrations. Second one, what would it take to double your business? Jake, what would it take to double your business? Well, it would take a large sum of cash and it would take uh, some more team members in place because we talk about the I'm a mentality and I'm a can't do everything. So we'd have to expand our team, get some uh, good folks in place to double the business and uh, it would take a little bit of seed money. Uh, but most, most importantly, it's, it's all about your people. So we would uh, we'd need to hire some more folks and uh, – and, and find a great property, a couple great properties to purchase. What I like about this question is it, I, you're identifying what you need to do to grow. If you never ask that question, you're stuck in a rut. At least you know what you need to grow. You need money, right? So how do you get the money? Well, you can do it one of two ways. You can beg, borrow, right? And you can say, Mom, I need we, money. We can get the money. we got to find the deals first, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. But I'm saying now that you, you know that, you're going to start learning how to syndicate because let's say we ran out of money. So at least you identify what you need. And you need to know that you need to grow your business. You need to buy another 200 units to double your business. So that's a really important question for anybody out there. The third one is, what have you tried and not tried? Now, this one might be tricky because sometimes people say to themselves, and they trick themselves into saying, you know, I've tried everything. How many things have you tried? I've tried thousands That's of things. That's self-limiting belief. That's Boom. right. How many things? Hundreds of things. Yep. How many things? Ten things. Well, really, how many things have you tried? Well, I tried this and I tried that and it didn't work and I quit. So you really have to really identify what you've tried and what you've not tried. Jake, when we, when we first started, what do we try? Well, me and Jake called one broker up and he said, you'll never do business here. So we thought we tried everything, but we <laughs> – Apparently didn't, right? Because we contacted other brokers, we changed our course, and we eventually succeeded. So it's really important to identify what you're doing and what you're not doing. Let let me chime in for a minute because your last question was, what would it take to double your business? And the next question, what have you tried and what have you not tried? So to double our business, we may have to syndicate. We may have to raise some private money out there, right? And mm-hmm. it says, what have you not tried? Well, we haven't syndicated yet. So it's kind of – it's it's funny how the, the the universe kind of pushes you in, in, in a direction. So maybe that's in our future, Gino. Maybe the well, syndication is coming down the line. 
And I want you guys, when you're writing these questions down, don't think about them. I want you to write them down on a piece of paper. Get your coach's sheet out. Write them down and see them because if you see them, your subconscious will be able to work on them. Something that's in your mind, that thought, if it's not really a desire, it's going to dissipate. It's going to float away. So, you know, what what if, what would it take to double your business? Well, you know, you know what it takes subconsciously, but if you write it down, you know, listen, what would it take to double your passive income, Jake? You know that number, right? It's amazing. My first year that I did this, I wrote down my passive income number. I hit that number at the end of the year. I wish I made that number bigger. Because if I had made that number bigger, I think we probably would have hit it. So it's really important to write stuff down on paper. I like it. And the last question, guys, what's the number one thing that you're trying to accomplish? You guys got to set a target out there. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, When we first started out, I think Jake and I wanted to get out of the rat race. I don't know what – if that would have been achievable, but I said, I just want to get out of the rat race. I want to get out of the restaurant and start doing this full time. And you know what? That's going to change because now all of a sudden I'm out of the rat race. I'm out of the restaurant and Jake can attest to it. He's out of it also. So I want to dominate. <laughs> <laughs> but what does that mean though? see, that's an, that's, that's an open-ended thing. What do you want to dominate and how? I can tell, I can tell you right now if you ask me. Tell me. What do you want to dominate? I want, I want to dominate the apartment uh, sector in East Tennessee. I want to be the largest owner of apartments in East Tennessee. Now that's great. You write that down, and that's something that you can work it's on. It's on my coach's sheet. <laughs> All right. So, and that's powerful. And you know what? The, the sad thing is, I, I think Jake is going to kill me. He's going to bring me through coals, <laughs> and he's going to really push me and get me out of my comfort zone. It's all getting out of your comfort comfort zone to be able to grow. And I think that is awesome. I think that's a great strategy. From you know, th- it's funny. Three years ago, if he had told me that, I'd say you're crazy. But at least I'm sure in the back of his mind, he always wanted to do that. But as you get bigger and you have more momentum, you know, write stuff down. Write stuff. Life is too short. To limit yourself. I mean, that's just the way it is. We all limit ourselves. We all think we can't do something. Write it down and be bold. Go get set it. Up, no, set no up kidding. a I like huge that. goal. Set up a massive goal because if you miss it, so what if you miss that massive goal? You're going to get any farther than you ever thought, right, Jake? Who would have thought you know, we'd have 700 units in three years? Write down 2,000 units at the end of three years. If you don't hit 2,000 units, I'm sure we'll be close to it, 1,200, 1,300. So people say, well, you failed. You didn't hit your goal. But you know what? You got a lot more than what you, what you bargained for, right? Totally, 100%. There's just one other thing that I want to you know, speak about with people, and I think it's really important. Um, something that's called energy, uh, anabolic and catabolic energy. I want people, when they start talking to themselves, just be careful what you say to yourself. Because what you say to yourself, you know, it really manifests itself and becomes part of who and what you do and who and what you are. Um, I want you guys to live in anabolic energy. This anabolic energy is really important. It's constructive. It's building. It's healing energy. You know, this... The energy re- releases, you know, anabolic hormones. It's it's so powerful to you. So you always want to be in a positive frame of mind. The catabolic energy is what a lot of people go through throughout the day. I can't do this. I can't do that. I, I think the most important thing that I learned from Rich Dad is, you know, I can't afford this. That's catabolic. Anabolic is how can I afford this? If you're saying to yourself, I can't do something, I can't get into apartments, then you know what? You can't get into apartments. The question should be is how do I get into apartments? And I think Jake and I have laid that out really well in these last four podcasts. How do you get into them? Well, if you can't get into them, you partner with somebody. You raise private money. Um, you, you do what you got to do. If that's what your goal is, there's always a way to do it. And you always have to think from an anabolic standpoint how to get your level of energy raised and how to engage people and how to really make it happen. I want to touch on this and expand upon it a little bit because it's something that we coach our managers on. And it's find a way to say yes. It may not always be easy, but don't tell a tenant no. Find a way to say yes. There's always something that can be done or at least get them closer uh, to what they want. And that's that's where the customer service comes in. Uh, Gino just raised my level of energy, got me thinking, and I related to something that can relate back and add value, hopefully, to your business. I just wanted to throw that in there. And Jake, there's one other thing that I like to throw in. I've been doing a lot of coaching with people. The first thing you got to do when you have a problem, we're always coming at a problem from negative energy, negative standpoint. I want everyone to step back, take a deep breath, and manage your state. A lot of people succeed and a lot of people fail due to their state. If you're looking at a problem from negative, from negative energy, from seeing things as I can't do this, it's not going to happen. Step back. Raise that level of energy, and you can do it certain ways. I mean, I've, I've done it with anchoring. I've, I do it with my incantations every day, and in every way I'm getting better and better every day, and in every way I'm getting stronger and stronger. I'll incant that often, and it'll just raise my energy level. My whole style, my whole physiology will just be, you know, 
it'll just be captivated. I'll just get myself into the mood. And all of a sudden, you feel your level of energy raising and you'll see, you'll, you'll see things differently. And it's, it's truly amazing. When you're looking at a problem from that perspective, you can really conquer anything. I, I always could tell Jake, he gets into arguments with an employee. When you're in the heat of the moment, you really can't think of something. Ten minutes later, when you calm down, you're sitting at your desk, you're like, wow, I could have, should have, should have said that. The reason why you didn't say that is because you were at that negative level of energy. You weren't conscious. You were just, you know, brought yourself down. But when you relax, you calm down and you think about it, anything can be solved. I want to give the listeners a real world example. And in, in my younger years, it may not have gone this way. And this is a real life example from yesterday. I get an email at 6 a.m. Uh, from our bookkeeper. She said, I got a stomach bug. I'm out sick. I'm out sick. I can't cut the checks for the, the uh, contractors. So guess what? Who's the fallback? Good mm-hmm. old Jakey boy. <laughs> and no, but <clears throat> I, I could have handled this a few ways. I could have got, oh, damn, crap. Find another bookkeeper in the, in the accounting firm. Do it. I don't want to deal with this shit. Excuse my French. But I didn't handle it that way. You strive to be a, a good person. Strive to be a nice person. I took a step back. I thought about it. Was it that big of a deal? No. I, res- I responded back. I hope you're feeling better. We got this. And that's exactly what happened. And I got the team around. We found a uh, we, we had a meeting point that day. We met at one of our offices, got the checks cut. Everyone got together. We had lunch. It was great. And we actually had a little lunch meeting with the managers. It worked out well, and it was actually a blessing in disguise. Had, a, had some really good business meetings yesterday with the managers. So I could have, you know, turned confrontational and said, well, we got to figure this out. No. Deal with it, move forward, and make the best out of it. And, and just try to take every situation that arises like that and just try to be a good person. Try to be a nice person. And a lot of times you will be benefited on the back end. You know what's crazy about that? <clears throat> it's just basically turning a problem into an opportunity. Um, it's, we yeah. all have bad yeah. stuff happen to us. You look at everyone who's massively successful. I mean even, <clears throat> even, my, even my, one of my mentors, I think, I think back to Rich Dad. How many times did he go bankrupt? I mean he could have said to himself – you know what what the heck's going on here but you know what he looked at the situation he looked at the problem and he actually readjusted it his problems turned into his opportunities they were learning opportunities and that's how he grew and i think that's how everyone should should take a look at every day there's always problems it's just not what happens it's how you react to it it's the cards you're dealt basically you have to deal with the cards you're dealt with and the way you deal with them is how you're going to be either be successful or be unsuccessful in life gino i think we could go on for another hour but in the essence of time (laughs) this was awesome great podcast today and i hope the listeners really found value in it jake i had a great time doing the podcast i love talking about life coaching i think everyone out there should really look for a life coach work on yourself first before you work on your business it's 80 percent psychological 20 percent mechanical you have to be ready to be able to be successful before you actually achieve success you have to want it and i think everyone out there has that ability we all deserve success in life We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.